to another instalment of uh, getting my L1360 back on the road. Today, hopefully, is going to be the day, the day that the engine goes back in. For that, I need some space. So, first job is to get the Spitfire out of the garage, and then we've got room to manoeuvre with the engine crane. So, let's get going. Okay, so I'm just about ready to go, but while it's still on the stand and to slightly more accessible height, I'm just going to mark up the pulley a little bit. So I'm going to be able to set it up as per the manual which uses the adjustment on the distributor. I've got a vernier distributor for this car, but this is going to let me get, have a look with the timing light and have an idea where I am. I only have a timing light that flashes, I don't have one where you can set it so it fires a certain number of degrees before or after top dead centre. And if I need to, I can seal myself a wheel on there. Right, let's get it off the stand. For the gearbox. Now, because this is because this is bronze on steel, I understand it shouldn't need lubrication. But the the manual specifies very very light greasing, so I'm putting tiny amount of lithium grease on it before it goes in. And then placement flywheel. The old one, the one on the car, had had. One of the clutch bolts cross threaded. So now these need talking, as does the front pulley bolt, but obviously the crankshaft will spin relatively easily. So I need to hold this in place. What I'm going to do is build a little stop that will bolt where the starter motor goes and hold the, the teeth of the ring gear. Now what I might do, I have, I think, some worn out starter motor pinions. So I might base it on that. But let's see, I'm going to scrounge some metal and see what I can come up with. So the first attempt is going to be this big chunk of steel. That'll bolt there. And I found this bracket of... No idea where it came from, but I'm going to cut there, get this corner bit off, chamfer these edges so they nicely fit in the tooth, and then weld it in there so I'll be able to slide it in and bolt it on. And we'll see how that goes.
there we are after a short uh, <laughs> lunch and coffee break so you've seen i put i put a little bit of heat into the metal with the blowtorch before trying to weld it and that's because this this steel is getting on for a bit thick for uh, my poor little welder so preheating the metal should increase my penetration and obviously this needs to be quite sturdy because we're trying to get it to hold a fair bit of torque but it should be fine because i managed to do it with a crowbar on the, on the line underneath the spitfire anyway let's try it okay that's installed these need to be 42 foot pound and that's probably fairly achievable So I haven't been able to find a good figure for this guy. It's probably about 90. So this is set to 42 still. So if we can get there quite easily. It's 70. Apparently there at 90. Now the DIY ring gear lock was more successful than I was expecting. I almost forgot the clutch. Also, I suppose, well, especially given this is a unknown flywheel, I'm going to check the run out. So we've got 0.1 millimetres allowed, three inches from the centre, which is what this is set up as. So we're fine there. Let's get the clutch on. Think about putting it in the car. Okay, so I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try getting it in as we are now. I think I might be able to come in diagonally, kind of wiggle the car and the engine stand around to get it in place. But I might also need to take the block off. So that's why now. <laughs>
Now there you go. One engine back in its, its home. I actually expected that to be a bit more difficult, but uh, it's, it was easier than it was easier than taking the gearbox out from inside the car. Definitely, I think engine and gearbox with this setup might have been a bit challenging. Whatever, doesn't matter. We weren't doing that, so here we go. Well, next thing is to get all the bolts properly done up because they're not. I've got it on with four gearbox bolts, four four bolts to the bell housing, gearbox bell housing, gearbox is mounted back, and I've got to do up these the front engine mounts. And then start throwing on things like manifolds and uh, fuel. I've got, got manifolds, fuel pump, radiator fan, thermostat bits, wiring, starter mode. Well, you know, there's a fair few things to do. <laughs> okay, but for the moment, I'm just gonna make sure the engine is secure. Okay, engine mountings bolted in. I've got I've got the starter motor and all the bolts between the bell housing and the engine block in. Not all tight but located. So almost all the bolts on that hold the gearbox on are the same thread. Except for this one right there here. That shiny one right in the centre of the picture is a 3 8 thread. And it's important. It's not in the manual. <laughs> it's not in the parts catalogue. But it's a slightly larger hold and it's responsible for aligning the uh, two parts. So it's the bottom, the bottom most one on the, on the manifold side of the engine. So I'm getting ready to put the fuel pump on. I've been trying to pull some spares out to give a comparison because there was a spacer on the block there and I wanted to show the short versus long arm pumps but it looks like everything I've got is the same. Anyway, this had a spacer on the block. It worked, so it's going back on with the spacer and I guess that's a long arm. So I got my exhaust manifold ready to go on. I managed to find a second hand one, well, a while back now, that hadn't had the, hadn't had the stud holes damaged. Not, it's not hugely. So I've had that skimmed and the face along there skimmed because they have a tendency to, to warp so the, the outer arms are much further in than the than the centre. And these are actually Land Rover exhaust studs because they are specified as exhaust studs whereas the, the ones you get from most Triumph laces now are just they're just a stud. It's that flattening out you want to watch out for. Lack of. I then subsequently found another one on eBay that was somebody had already done, which is of course handy for, and they've got a Spitfire as well. So I got a couple of things done yesterday, but I don't know, I wasn't, <laughs> wasn't really feeling it, I guess. You see, I managed to get my ha thermostat housing on backwards. So yeah, got to get that switched around. But it is just the, in terms of things that need to go on the engine, the manifolds and the carbs, then start connecting radiator hoses and control cables and all that sort of stuff. So I have just been cracking on getting stuff on the engine. So that's both the manifolds on, all of the cooling hoses hooked up that I can do, obviously not got the radiator yet. Fan on, got the, the water return tube under the manifold. I think this is a DIY thing, but there was this, the spring on there was for, was for the return on the throttle. Also got fed up of scrubbing in the dark, so I have, and I got a lightsaber. Which is, uh, yeah, which is great. <laughs> so I think I've got to hunt down some bits for the top of the gearbox, put together that gear linkage, and I got the clutch connected up, and probably the side valances and radiator, and the last thing would be the carburetors. Oh, wiring. Connect up the temperature transmitter and the oil, and start the motor. Yeah, you know, <laughs> plenty, plenty to do. Anyway, I think I'm going to stick with updates unless anything particularly interesting happens because this is just kind of throwing stuff on and doing up bolts and jubilee clips and so on. So, I just uh, spent a while last night searching for this little thing. And I had put it somewhere sensible with the rest of the gearbox parts. So, so this is the cam that goes onto the gear change mechanism and activates the overdrive cutout switch on the gearbox. I didn't build up a gear change linkage when I built the overdrive gearbox for the Herald because all the rest of the gear linkage I knew I had in good condition recently rebushed, recently refurbished on the car. So I wanted to transfer all those bits over. So now I need to take apart the, the Herald's gear change linkage and fit this and the corresponding shaft to build up one that's going to work and also have the capability to switch the overdrive. Uh, so I had to do a bit of hunting around to make sure I had everything I needed. I do, and it was all in sort of sensible places. I've decided to 
go the full full way and replace these the seals that sit inside here. A bit of a pain and this possibility that the new rubber is going to be no good very shortly. But I've just got one out and it's definitely it's definitely harder and I can see the wear on the inside of it. And this, this bit is actually completely unknown. I've never had it on a car, so it makes sense. They're not proving too difficult to move, just with the point of a scriber there. Okay, so I've got the old seals out, and I'm trying to get the new ones in, which may be the more difficult bit. Mm -hmm. Went quite easily. Yeah, well, those are in. Okay, this is looking symmetrical. I mean, it should be symmetrical, shouldn't it? This goes this way round, so we've got the this other bit of this linkage sits in there, and this parallel to this plane. We need our shift finger. This is the bit that actually goes into the internals of the gearbox and engages with the top cover and makes the shift happen. That needs to be in the middle, in neutral, so that's right. And it doesn't matter which way round. We've got this end. And then the same here. That's got to hold this cam. It also shouldn't matter which way round this rod is either. I think this must have to go the that makes sense. The overdrive switch is on the right hand side of the gearbox facing forward. It's gonna be there. So that needs to go with the flat side facing in, makes sense. It's a bit of gear oil. So if I position the line, the line up the hole, there's quite a lot of space there, which seems odd. I'm just going to do this to hold it temporarily. <laughs> Hope I've not mixed up the this one with the very slightly different one that's on the Spitfire. Because the Spitfire is a very slightly later mechanism, where instead of this sort of sheet metal or plate, shaped cam. It has machined or cast a piece of metal that acts on just one side because the reverse switch, which is what this side would do, is embedded in the in the top cover. But that might have meant this section was actually slightly different sized and I didn't notice when I put that top cover together. Now on the car this looks to be in the right place. In neutral it's sent or yeah when it turns as if we were turns this way if we're going to shift to third or fourth, we're right in the centre of this. So the switch is engaging right in the centre, which is where the wear mark is, which is what we'd expect. So I think even if this, this might be wrong, this might be supposed to be a longer shaft, slightly longer shaft, but given it's not going to have to take a great deal of load, you know, we're only switching one, one plasticky, well, one easy to actuate switch. I'm going to try as it is. Actually, there's another clue. You can see where the, the shaft is brighter. Got a good way through with the soft vice jewels. Yeah, it's just out the other end.
So on this this shift housing actually demonstrates quite nicely why there's a correct way round for this bolt. Because you can see here, um, previously someone has had it in the wrong way round. Because once we're in, you know, this is extreme, we don't actually go that far over. You know, the shift would go to about, maybe about there. But if there's a knot protruding off the other side, you can see it's worn away at that housing. Or, or someone's notched it out. But regardless, that's how this is supposed to go. So that bit goes inside there, then goes inside there, a whole lot over the gear lever. And wash over the wash over the spring. And get some oil in the gearbox and get this on. So one of the reasons I like to put the, the shifter on when it's in the car, when the gearbox is in the car, is because then you can fill with oil just through the top. And I've got the drain plug out on this side, so I can watch we have been full enough. I don't usually bother with sealing this gasket. It's just a splash protection, and I think it's more going to be making a mess here is going to be more trouble than it's worth. Now, when this goes on, it's going to make sure you're in neutral. Okay, so I've slowly, slowly, slowly been getting the fan on, new fan belt. It's a it's one of these I'm using. This is a, a 1063, and you can see, you can see where the alternator's sitting. So the mid adjustment. The standard one is a 1025 and it's too short and is what I bought first. Asking the supplier for one that would fit an alternator equipped car. I didn't get. Uh, so this is what I had one of these on the car before and it's actually uh, it's actually spec'd for a Fiat Panda or Fiat 127 I found. So yeah anyway that's on. Just got the bits of wiring in, alternator, um, oil and temperature. So all the cooling hoses are hooked up, except for obviously the radiator. So what I've got left is just about to put the clutch cylinder in, get that bled. I want to get that in firstly because of access without having the engine bay valances in there. I suppose that doesn't matter. But anyway, I want to get the clutch cylinder in because I want the clutch to work, because I want to run, while I run the engine for the first time, I also want to spin up the gearbox, just because I, then they can check that it's all going to go into gear, clutch is going to work properly, and that the overdrive will come on. And I've not I've not connected the prop shaft up, so we're just going to be able to run the gearbox and engine with a loose, pro loose prop shaft. Anyway, so I'm going to get that on. Engine bay valances, radiator, carburettors. It might be ready for first start. I'm not getting the clutch in. I'm not getting the clutch working this weekend because the slave cylinder mounting bracket I've got will not fit with the three rail, three synchro gearbox I've just put in. Because there were previously I had this four. This is a this is a three rail, four synchro box. This is the the mount that was on here, and it turns out they uh, there seems to be one part number from what I can find, but they're different. I've photos. I've just found some photos online, and the the Herald mount looks different, and this well, I can see it won't face it won't fit on the, well, on the other side, but should go in there. 
mirrored. But the rib on the earlier casting, the box that's in the car, is bigger. So this won't actually go all the way as far as close to the case as it's supposed to, or as it needs to. So I mean really this isn't going to stop me doing what I was intending. I can still start the engine, but just without the clutch fitted. I'll have to buy another part. Anyway, I pull this junk back away. Alright, so I did a, I've done a bit of searching and I couldn't find anything to tell me for sure that there were different earlier and later parts. There's only one part number. So, I filed a bit of a flat on the side of this one and now it goes on quite nicely. So, I'm going to get that installed. I did pop the side panels in place last night. They're just sitting there. I'll get them bolted on. Get the radiator on. Get in there. Now I've managed to get the clutch slave in. I need to bleed, bleed the system, put the fluid in. And I'm quite, I'm quite a fan of an easy bleed because when they work, <laughs> they're very easy. The only, um, only kind of issue is getting them fitted to and sealed on the master cylinder. Unfortunately, these these are both county county brand cylinders, which are the cheaper end of what you can get, but they, t they do tend to seal okay with these. Uh, auto brake bleeder. So if you've not seen these before, it's a bottle with an attachment for the top of the cylinder, and then this hose connects to the spare tyre or a tyre. So you apply pressure and then open the bleed valve at the other end and everything comes out. So this currently has no fluid in because I want to test the that the pressure will hold. So I'm just going to connect it to the tyre and listen. So I was able to hear that fill up and not leak, so it should be safe to use. And the problem obviously if they don't seal properly is that you spray brake fluid everywhere. <laughs> and I don't want that. So now I'm going to crawl in the footwell and actually open the bleed valve. What I do have a habit of doing when bleeding the clutch, when it's completely, well, bleeding the clutch generally, is taking it off, usually taking the mounting bracket off, tilting it slightly. That puts the bleed valve at the very top. Otherwise, because of the, the kind of the design of the cylinder, which is, you know, you've got a cylinder sitting flat and there's a void and then a, a bleed at one end, you can have a, a bubble right at the top that's not getting near the bleed valve. So if you tilt it up slightly, you can get the whole thing out. Oh, you know, all the air out. Okay, that should now be done. So if I take this off, we should just have a nice amount of fluid in as well. It needs a bit of a top up. So there's the side valances and the radiator in. I've not put the bar that goes across the bottom that holds the horns in yet, just because just because that's a one tiny little thing less to take apart if it turns out I need to take apart stuff again. Got got the carbs in. I'm having a bit of trouble getting the linkage hooked up because I can't quite remember how it goes. These are cable operated Spit Mark IV HS2s. So I'm just gonna have to fish out the everything I've got. Everything I've got downstairs is I uh, is an earlier earlier Spitfire or Herald manual, so I'm just gonna have to find out the right bits of information. Have a look there. I did remember slash figure out 
that I needed to, well, that where I'd routed the wiring was incorrect. So it's supposed to, the, that loom that goes to the front is supposed to go along the inside of this valance and I'd done it Spitfire style where I'd, I'd routed it underneath the suspension to it. So I've had that out, put that back. I'm going to get the carbs in properly, figure out some fuel lines. I'm probably going to run it if I can to start with. And then I think that's... Oh no, I've got to do seal the rocker cover properly. Why do I leave it open? Probably so I can look and see that we're on top dead centre for the firing stroke when setting the distributor in the right position. Anyway, one thing at a time. Get the carburetor sorted, get the fuel system in. Getting closer. Right, so only real thing left to do. Get the static timing set, get some oil pressure in and try and fire it. I've, I've got my fuel lines in, so I'm running around the back there, the one in between the two carburettors, throttle and choke connected, got the accelerator pedal in the car as well. Distributor's just sitting there, this distributor's been off to the distributor doctor, who has a very good reputation for Lucas distributor um, refurbishment, or restoration. So it's come back looking very shiny, it's all set up inside, it should be should be turnkey, except for the timing. They, they um, even replated the, the clamp for me as well. You can see at the bottom there. So, so yeah, I've got the, the start motor, the starter motor is connected. I've got the earth wire for the, the distributor itself to ground the points, or where the points ground through. I don't think there's anything else. So I'll get the plugs back out, get the engine turned, I'll figure it, find out what the static timing figure is, get the engine turned around, get that done. I might have to manufacture myself something for spinning the oil pump. Anyway, let's get the static timing done. Then we can lift the whole distributor off just with the clamp in place. We need to go back straight back on and be correct. You know what? I'm actually going to end this episode here. So, there we go. <laughs> We've got the engine almost there. I, I've had a look. I've tried to see if you remember I made some timing marks on the crankshaft pulley. I can't really see them uh, with the radiator in. So I think the best thing to do is going to be to use the process described in the manual to set the static timing where you got the engine at top dead centre and then use the vernier adjuster on the distributor to move back and forth. A certain number of clicks equals a certain number of degrees. So that gets to a point where we can start the engine. I've also got to make up something to let me drive the oil pump because I want to spin that manually to start with and prime the oil system in the engine. So that is what we're going to do uh, next time. So thanks a lot for watching. Thanks to everyone who comments. All of you who are subscribed. If you're not subscribed, think about doing so please. <laughs> and um, I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.